September 1939, and the most vicious war machine the world has ever known launches an attack to conquer all of Europe. German troops pour across Poland, Czechoslovakia, Holland, Belgium, and France. Night after night, thousands of bombs rain down on London. But in both England and Russia, the people hold firm and fight back. On the other side of the world, the fires of war are also raging in China and beyond. Japanese forces attack and conquer most of Eastern Asia and the islands of the Pacific. Then, without warning, on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor, and the United States, the last bastion of freedom, is thrown into the war. To turn the tide of aggression, millions of tons of war materiel pour across the seas from America. Food, trucks, airplanes, tanks, munitions, oil, all destined for ports in England, China, Russia, and North Africa. But the U-boat wolf packs take their toll, cutting the lifeline to freedom. Protected by the Allied navies, great convoys are amassed as the key to victory. The free world needs ships, and only the United States, with her resources and genius for mass production, can undertake this monumental task, providing cargo ships, navy oilers, and tankers. This film, prepared here at Marin Ship in 1945, tells through their own eyes of the patriotism, devotion, and hard work of the people who accomplished the miracle at Marin Ship. Here is a tanker. Deep in her hold, she carries the oil, which means victory in war and prosperity in peace. This is the Mission Purissima, standard bearer of a proud fleet. The Mission and Hills class tankers, built exclusively by Marin Ship Corporation, and named for the Spanish missions and petroleum fields of their native California. They were built to a super modern design to carry the Marin ship flag proudly around the world for many years. Three months after Pearl Harbor, a wire from the U.S. Maritime Commission started the W.A. Bechtel Company and five affiliates building a new shipyard nestled at the foot of beautiful Mount Tamalpais on the shores of San Francisco Bay. This was the site for America's finest shipyard, the Salt Marsh and the Rocky Hill. On March 28, 1942, earth-moving machinery began its miraculous work. Pipes were laid, big tired carryalls began to move a million yards of earth. On concrete foundations arose great buildings as work rushed on night and day. Just 91 days after groundbreaking, Kiel for the first Liberty ship was laid. Greetings came from Carl Flesher of the U.S. Maritime Commission. Ken Bechtel presented his brother Steve, a vice president, and Ray Hamilton took over as production manager for the entire yard. A mobile crane lifted the first piece of flat keel and dropped it onto the waiting keel block. On September 26, 1942, came the great day, launching of the first Marine ship vessel, the Liberty ship William A. Richardson. Invited to share the thrill were the families of all Marine ship workers. 20,000 persons stood about the flag draped bow. There she goes. The champagne spray bursts in time with the shouts of 20,000 voices. The Richardson slides quietly and proudly into San Francisco Bay. Now, fully waterborne, the ship begins to drag the chains that bring her under control. And so was born the first of 15 Marin Ship Liberties, which were to carry war cargo to Normandy, Leyte, and around the world. These were the ships which turned the tide of war. But Marin Ship was destined for bigger, tougher things. Out of the blue, following an aerial survey of Marin Ship, Vice Admiral Howard L. Vickery, builder of the Victory Fleet, brought news of a more critical job. 
On six continents and five oceans, American planes, tanks, and trucks needed gasoline. Marin ship was chosen to build the vitally needed tankers with 10,000 horsepower motors, a powerful model never built anywhere else. Speaking to 16,000 Marin ship employees, Admiral Vickery assigned them their new job. Soon from atop the sub-assembly building, the maritime M pennant with three gold stars flew beneath the stars and stripes. Strange new shapes in steel and odd patterns in wooden templates marked the start of tanker construction. Here were many new problems to be met and solved. By the middle of 1943, without loss of a single day, the entire yard had been converted into a great tanker production line. Ship followed ship. Within two years from the first tanker launching, from this yard had sailed more than a million deadweight tons of tanker capacity. A vast pipeline to Tokyo, carrying American victory. To find the secret of the Marin ship miracle of production, we must look to many ingredients. First, there were the workers living in a beautiful new community less than a mile from the shipyard. Marin City was built for them and their families by the federal government. Schools, hospitals, stores made up a model community. Other workers that one might see flowing in and out of the gates came from San Francisco and nearby cities of Marin County and the Bay Area. Many men and women came by bus to a unique in-yard transportation terminal. Here they passed through gates protected by uniformed officers. Arriving for work aboard the picturesque Marin ship ferry for each of the three daily ships, one would see men and women who a few months before knew nothing about shipbuilding, but trained and guided, their collective skills tossed into the common pool of endeavor, built ships unsurpassed anywhere for craftsmanship. Busiest units in the yard were the 150 horsepower diesel electric dinkies, which rushed to the right location all the steel which marine ship expediters and traffic experts had procured in the face of war's material shortages and transportation bottlenecks. Safely in the yard, steel was unloaded from gondolas into steel racks. Here were not only sheet steel of all thicknesses, but also beams and shapes of every kind. Catalogued and ready, a library of steel. Then as it was needed, the steel was placed aboard big semi-trailers or put in racks so that the fast-moving heisters could quickly pick it up and take it to the fabricating shops. In the big plate shop, this steel was handed over to one of the 15-ton bridge cranes, which moved it to where it would be punched, cut, bent, and welded in the first manufacturing step, while beautiful Mount Tamopias lay serene in the background. In the sub-assembly shop, Hundreds of man-hours were saved by building this 61-ton stern section in the shop, where it could lie on its side to allow easier access. Its intricate pattern of steel contrasts with the graceful simplicity of a bow section. As one tanker is launched, another is born. Keel for the new ship is swung into place by a giant crane. Then, like streams meeting to form a wide river, the steel from many shops joins on the ways. Twenty-four hours later, see the transformation. All in one day, trained crews have landed 1,600 tons on the keel blocks. Another pipeline to Tokyo is on its way. Largest of all ship sections is this 115-ton engine room, foundation for the heart of the ship. Only at Marin ship was the great 10,000 horsepower propulsion motor lifted in one piece onto the hull, and then aligned so that its shaft will meet the propeller with mathematical precision. Most dramatic moment occurs when two yellow cranes unite to lift the entire upper part of a midship deckhouse weighing 62 tons. The upper part is lifted away so that the lower section with which it has been built may be uncovered and later moved first onto the ship. Now the powerful all-electric cranes return to pick up the 80-ton lower section. High in the air, the section is rolled smoothly to a point near the way for which it is destined. 
Nestled against the side of the Marin ship dock, we get the first full look at the 523-foot ship with her graceful modern lines. 350,000 different pieces of steel, all welded into a single one-piece tanker. Deft painters apply the final coat in readiness for many months at sea. In the galley, gleaming Monel metal tables, chromium soup kettles, and the large electric stove invite the culinary best from the ship's cooks. In coming months, the ship's officers are to eat many a fine meal at these tables and enjoy many a steaming cup of hot coffee when the sea blows cold. The source of all ship's energy are the two big boilers. The sweating workman applies the torch to the atomized oil, and the roar of life fills the boiler room. As the rudder moves from side to side, the propeller takes its first grip of the sea. Here is power and despair. Tankers also became fighting ships of the United States fleet. At the bow were two three-inch guns. At the stern were many anti-aircraft and the big five-inch cannon, which could hold her own with many warships. On the morning of the trial run, dawn breaks cool and clear across San Francisco Bay. Smoothly, the tanker glides away from the dock. Now, for the first time, she is a living thing, filled with spirit and ready for the sea. In the chart room, sea-wise hands plot a course through the Golden Gate onto the wide Pacific. Officers confirm their plan with the aid of a navigating compass. Suddenly, the pilot swings the rudder hard to port. The vessel groans and trembles at the shock. But like a veteran, the ship swings about, leaving proof on the sea of another test well met. Now the pilot suddenly wheels to starboard. The rudder turns, and with it the ship, tracing a great arc. Out under the Golden Gate Bridge, the tanker heads for the horizon. Nearly 50 miles offshore, huge swells begin to buffet the ship. She dips and rises, adjusting her great form to the ocean's unruly surface. Mile upon mile, she keeps the pace. This is the grueling endurance run, taking the final measure of seaworthiness. The test completed with flying colors, the ship turns homeward. With a fresh notch cut in its side, a broom is raised to the mast, proving that this marine ship tanker has swept the seas. Final ship to pass through these operations was the Mission San Francisco. Flag-draped cranes form an archway for the 93rd and last marine ship vessel, while 5,000 workers and their families join in celebration. A Navy blimp adds its congratulations to marine ship for a job well done. Down the ways for the last time, as clouds of confetti and streamers tell the festive story of pride and joy. Here is the last proud member of a distinguished fleet, built at Marin Ship. Just a few days earlier, Marin Ship's contribution to victory was undeniably proven when the U.S. surrender fleet sailed into Sagami Bay off Tokyo. With that great armada were eight marine ship Navy oilers, half of the ships of that class built at marine ship. 
and leading them was the Tamil Pyre, flagship of the Marin ship fleet. The ships and the cheering launch crowds are gone now, but the freedom their devotion and patriotism gave us lives on. Now private property, the old shipways buildings provide offices and workshops for maritime businesses. The Fitters Warehouse is now home to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Bay Model and the Marine Ship Exhibit. The executive offices are now occupied by numerous small professional businesses. The Mold Loft where the patterns for the steel plates were cut, now houses, artists, sailmakers, and ship's chandlers. And the outfitter's docks adjacent to the bay model is now home to the fishing fleet. The ships and cheering launch crowds are gone now. But the spirit of those days lives on in the freedom they gave us. Well, I, I came to Sausalito in August of 1917 when I was 12 years old. And uh, I grew up there practically, you might say. And uh, at that time, uh, Sausalito was primarily a railroad town. That's how I, I landed there. My father was a railroad man. At that time, uh, in the 30s, we only had three policemen. And uh, one of them was on at nighttime, and two of them were on the daytime. It was very nice and, and quiet. Uh, at night and so forth. As uh, we all know, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and that set everything off, naturally. And uh, It was such an urgent matter, starting from early in March, that the Bechtel people were told to build a shipyard and to build ships, originally Liberty ships, and deliver one ship by the end of the year for use in the war effort, even though the shipyard itself would not be completed even at that time. No permits, no nothing, no environmental impact reports, no traffic surveys, no nothing. They just went right ahead. And one of the significant things is they had to, to uh, move a whole hill down. I forget how many, uh, 800 and something uh, thousand cubic yards of earth had to be moved and 40 houses. They moved 40 houses in nine days to a different location, which was significant. Uh, as somebody said, you can hardly get a mailbox up in a day now. There's no doubt about it, this country really turned to in the war. The damnedest thing you ever saw. We've never done anything like it since. One ship was built from laying the keel to delivery of the boat. This was a, a tanker. It was built in 33 days from the laying of the keel to the delivery. That means the acceptance of the ship. 33 days, it's unheard of. We had to work six days a week, eight hour shifts. And the sixth day paid time and a half. So you actually were getting uh, more pay than you were prior to the war because you were working longer and you were working at a higher premium wage for that extra time. So it was attractive for the workers uh, and that was one reason we got people from the South who probably had never made wages anything like that. My cousin lived in Marin City, was a welder in Sausalito Marin Shipyard. She wrote that we should come here and work. So I came out on the train uh, they only had two coaches for black people, and I rode in the aisle on my suitcase. I sat on my suitcase the distance from Shreveport to California. So I started making a dollar and twenty an hour, where I had made a little more perhaps than a dollar twenty a week in Shreveport. Things was really looking up for me. Well, these people were intelligent, competent people, even though they weren't used to the work. They could learn it and did. I just got started uh, in, in, in the lithograph business about a couple of years, I guess. I was just you know, starting to make, make waves and, and getting along pretty good when uh, this all happened. So uh, I, 
the only thing I could do would be to get a job as a welder, which I knew nothing of. I don't know why I decided to become a welder because I didn't even know what a welder did. But there was a little school up in San Rafael, San Rafael High School. And uh, I learned something from that welder teacher that stood me in good stead in my teaching when I went back to teaching after the war. Uh, he had a little couple of booths there and you could go there and learn how to weld an hour a day. And I went up there and he showed me how to do all the stuff like putting the rod in the stinger and so on and so forth. And I proceeded to get it stuck. And it stuck for an hour. And he said, come back tomorrow. It might be better. So I went back tomorrow and I proceeded to get the rod stuck on the steel again. And that happened three days in a row. And on the third day, I said, I don't think I'd better come back. Apparently, I'm not going to ever be a welder. He said, come on back. I said, try it again. So the fourth day, just everything fell into place. And I was welding up a storm. And he said, gee, you don't need to come back here. Go down to the shipyard. The foreman came along and says, Brownie, uh, uh, we, uh, we're going to need a leaderman up in the bays. And uh, uh, we're losing somebody. I was only... Uh, Something like 24 years old, and uh, the other 20 or 25 members of, of my gang I was working with were all older uh, older men. They were they were old carpenters, some of them who'd been working with wood all their lives. And I, I said to the foreman, uh, "Are you sure you want me to try this? I, uh, I'm going to be ordering around a, a, a group of old timers here. I don't know whether that's going to work." And the foreman said, uh, I remember he said one thing. He says, you're young and you move fast, you'll do. <laughs> the foreman came by and he said, well, uh, we're going to need uh, women uh, working. We're going to need women working uh, in the yard because on the different crafts because so many men were being drafted and going into the service. And he said, you have aptitude for ship uh, building. And so I'm going to teach you to read the blueprint and, and that kind of uh, all of the fundamentals of the shipbuilding and so you can be a shipfitter and I thought well what difference but I didn't ever think about being a shipfitter so I went ahead and I learned to read the blueprint first one thing and the other so one day he came up and, and uh, with a little piece of paper for me to sign and he said uh, you will now be a shipfitter and I still thought I'd just work with some shipfitters so I went back in the next day and he signed me a, a helper and a burner and a welder and from then on I was a shipper. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't imagine it. I had never seen a ship let alone been aboard one before and I couldn't imagine how they assembled all these sheets of metal to make this this work and sail on water. It was really awesome for me. It was a great experience for the women because it was a I think they did uh, uh, well, gain more self-confidence and everything because as the first time they became more self-reliant because it's the first time they'd actually been really you know doing uh, uh, work right alongside the men and you they figured that they you know that if they could do that they could just almost take care of any problem that came up <laughs> in those days you know um uh, wives really didn't work i mean the husbands felt that they were the sole support and all. So it was very hard for me to go to work at Marin Ship because um, it wasn't the thing to do. But sooner or later, it just got to the point, you know, everybody got motivated patriotically to the point where you just felt if you weren't doing something for the war effort that you were really um, not really with it. We grew up on a farm and ranch and and I knew kind of some of the principles of a building because you, I knew everything had to be plumb and square and knew how to find the, uh, the circumference of a circle and, and a lot of the things, you know, and I knew the different tools and how to handle them. And see, there wasn't too many men that even knew those things because so many of the men were butchers and bakers. And <laughs> Marine ship actually had a, a woman executive who was hired exact, uh, precisely to look after women's affairs. That had never been necessary in a plant before because there weren't any women in the working field force. I never will forget one day and I came to work and uh, on my time card there was a little note said that from now on women will not uh, come to the shipyard with uh, 
sweaters on because they distract the men's attention. And I don't know how they thought that anybody would distract a man's attention because we had about five layers of clothes on. We had hard hats on with bandanas to hide all of our hair. We had real heavy, big shoes with, a, you know, steel-toed shoes and big hard hats. <laughs> so I don't think it was any Marilyn Monroe's. All of a sudden they decided that uh, the women couldn't work in the shipyard anymore because they were not members of the union and they couldn't become members of the union because they were women. So that was a kind of impasse and the Bechtel or somebody said, well, since most of the welders are women, we're going to have to shut down the shipyard if you won't let them work. So they let us join the union. So the first union meeting was advertised and the whole crew of us, about 20 of us, went over to the Union Hall in San Francisco. And apparently no one had ever appeared at a union meeting before. There were just the three, I remember somebody named Ed Rainbow. I don't know who the rest of them were. There were three, three people sitting there and they were so astonished when we walked in and sat down that they canceled the meeting. It was dirty, hard work. You work there in July when the sun has been beating down on these inch thick plates all day and you have welding leathers and pants on. I used to sometimes stand up and the sweat would just run down my legs in a big puddle at my feet. It was so hot. It was terrible. Well, I had leathers, uh, uh, cover, uh, like, you know, coveralls and a bib type and, and a leather jacket. And that's what kept you from burning up. Burning. <laughs> and, 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 and the didn't. stuff would, would just roll off of you, but it would go down your neck, you know? And it was just like throwing ice cold water down there. And all of a sudden, when it, when it would hit the belt or something, you were really up. <laughs> and you'd be on fire sometimes, you know? Really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really. But I can remember the thing that helped me get this overhead weld. You have to lay it in like this. You don't just do this because it's molten and it'll fall. So you lay it in and come back and lay it in, was to sing stormy weather over and over and over <laughs> to get this beat, <laughs> you know. I had one little welder woman who was chewed tobacco. I'd never seen anybody chew tobacco before and she could, pssst, the ch tobacco stream 20 feet away. She was fascinating. Well, it seemed like we all live alike. Yeah, we were living in the same place and some of the same houses. And it seemed like people just seemed like people was people. Uh, through the paint department one time, I was on board when they launched the ship. And I was, you know, I didn't launch the ship, but I was on there. And I thought, well, this is really going to be fun when that hits the water. <laughs> well, of course, when it hit the water, it was just, you know, absolutely smooth. But that was kind of a big thing to be on there and, and be able to see all the people down below doing the launching. It's a very thrilling moment when the ship starts down the ways. It just comes to life. One of the most important was the launching of our USS Tamil Pius, which was the flagship, so denominated, uh, of, of our Marine ship fleet of 92 vessels. And it was named after, a, after the Mount Tamil Pius. But since we weren't naming vessels after mountains, we were naming them after rivers. We had the Board of Supervisors of Marin County declare that a creek coming down from that mountain uh, was the Tamil Pius Creek. Now we were set to name a ship the Tamil Pius. I had been to college for five years and all of that kind of stuff, but I didn't know anything at all about what America was like until I worked in the shipyard. <laughs>